me. Um, Daniel 10, 11, and 12 are one integrated whole. When we say we just focus on Daniel 11, we forget that Daniel 10, 11, and 12 go together. And so you can't understand Daniel 12 without 11, you can't understand 11 without 10. Uh, it's one integrated unit. And so when you turn to Daniel 10, 11, and 12, what you find is that we always want to talk about who is the king of the north and who is the king of the south, yes? That those, these, these, these end-time eschatological players in prophecy. But the, the, the major player is actually Jesus. It's not these kings of the north and kings of the south. And so if you look at Daniel 10... We start this out where Daniel, he's praying and fasting in verse 2 for three weeks. And he hasn't showered for three weeks. Hasn't anointed himself for three weeks. And finally he has a vision. And he has a vision of Jesus Christ. And you see that there in Daniel chapter 10. I'll pick it up in verse 5. It says, I looked up and saw a man clothed in linen with a belt of gold from Uphaz around his waist. His body was like beryl, his face like lightning, his eyes like flaming torches, his arms and legs like the gleam of burnished bronze, and the sound of his words was like the roar of a multitude. And so this is a vision, we believe, when you cross-reference with Revelation chapter 1. So Jesus appears to Daniel at the end of his life. And it's interesting, if you just rearrange the books of Daniel chronologically, Daniel becomes a prophet in his 70s, not when he's a teenager. You know, in the early chapters, God appears to Nebuchadnezzar, and Daniel interprets, but he doesn't get a dream of his own. And uh, uh, then um, God, the writing on the wall of Daniel 5 is Belshazzar's feast in 538 BC, the fall of Babylon. And Daniel 7 is when Daniel has his first vision, which is about the third year of Darius. He's been a captive for about 73 years. So he's, he's, an, ad he's an advanced old age man by the time he gets his first vision. So we think that he's a prophet through his life. He has his first, first bona fide vision when he's an old man. Uh, the point about that is that, you know, we want God to appear to us in our youth, but God has revealed himself directly to Daniel as an old man. Daniel had been faithful through his life, and at the, just before he dies in Daniel 10, 11, and 12, these are the last chapters of his life, this is when Jesus appears to him personally. Okay, so as you look through Daniel's life, um, how God reveals himself to Daniel is more and more open till finally Jesus appears to him personally. Which is good news for us, isn't it? That Daniel's been faithful all his life and at the end of his life he finally meets Jesus, which is a big deal because by the time Daniel 12 happens, many of the Jews have already gone back to Babylon and Daniel knows he's going to die uh, in, in a foreign land. He's not going to go back to Jerusalem, the land of his birth. So Jesus appears to him in Daniel 10. And if you look at Daniel 12, Daniel 12 begins with... Who does it begin with? Michael, uh, who we believe is, is Jesus. At that time, Michael, the great prince, the protector of your people, shall stand. There shall be a time of anguish such as has never occurred since nations began. But at that time, your people will be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. Many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. But those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky, and those who lead many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so Jesus appears at the beginning of this prophecy. He appears at the end of this prophecy. Then if you drop down into Daniel 11 itself, most scholars recognize that in the middle of this passage, at Daniel 11 verse 22, it says there, armies shall be utterly swept away and broken before him and the prince of the covenant as well. So who is the prince of the covenant? It's Jesus. Now, there's a few scholars who say that's not who it means, but by and large, pretty much every Adventist interpreter um, recognizes that this, and you can date 11, Daniel 11, 22, to Jesus' death on Calvary in AD 31. And so Jesus appears at the beginning of the vision, he appears at the end of the vision, and he appears in the middle of the vision. He appears at the middle of the vision to comfort an old man and give him the assurance of eternal life. He appears at the end of the division to defend his people, and he appears in the middle of the vision um, to destroy sin. So the, the, Daniel 11 actually is a picture of Jesus at work in various, the various things that Jesus does. Now, um, <clears throat> coming back to, you know, that's a very, very, very broad view of Daniel 11. 
The rest is, as a lawyer would say, obiter dicta, like other words. But we want to know who these kings of the south and the kings of the north are because they are persecuting powers. So, uh, as a general rule, and I'm just going to... Can you see that thing on the screen there? Is it too far away from you? Let's see if I can get any bigger. All right. So, uh, we know, or I hope we know, or if we don't know now, we will know in a minute, that there are three basic approaches to prophecy, at least historically. The first is the, the, the historicist approach. And the historicist approach says that Let's say Daniel 2 is a great example. From the time Daniel 2 was given, it, that prophecy flows through history to the second coming of Jesus. And so these prophecies have an outworking in human history with real actors in real time and real empires and kings and emperors and so forth. And that's the standard Adventist approach to prophecy. It's the historicist approach to prophecy. And so the, prof the prophecies of Scripture go from the time of Jesus or the time of Daniel or the time of John the Revelator all the way down to the coming of Jesus and beyond up to the millennium and so forth. And without historicism, you don't have Adventism. Amen. It's as simple as that. You cannot be an Adventist without a historicist understanding of prophecy. And then you have um, part of the Counter-Reformation. So when, when Luther had the Reformation, the Catholic Church wanted to fight back about it and so um, they, they came up with two alternate ways of understanding prophecy. And this is called the Counter-Reformation, the first of which was called Praetorism. Now, Praetorism comes from a Spanish Jesuit priest called Louis de Alcazar, and he argued that all the prophecies were fulfilled in the time that they were given to the prophets. Now, there's a, there's a big implication for this. You see, if, um, if the historicist interpretation is correct, who is the persecuting beast of, Revely, of Daniel 7? Rome. But if all the prophecies were fulfilled in the time of Daniel, which is the praetor's position, what happens to Rome in those prophecies? Doesn't feature, because that will happen 600 BC. So that gives the Catholic Church a buy. None of it applies to us. So that's the praetorist view. And then the futurist view holds that... Um, there, there's a gap. So if you look in Daniel chapter 9, to give you an example, if you look in Daniel chapter 9, you've got the 70 week prophecy. And the 70 week prophecy um, is one of the most beautiful prophecies of the Messiah. And many Jews at the time of Jesus understood that this 70 week prophecy, uh, 70 weeks represents how many days? 490 days, 490 years, 70 times 7. So this is a 490 year prophecy. But if you look in the text, it says Daniel 9, 25, Know therefore and understand. So God wants us to understand this. From the time that the word went out to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until the time of an anointed prince. You have a prince who's anointed, the Messiah. There shall be seven, seven weeks, and for 62 weeks it shall be built again with streets and a moat, but in a troubled time. And after the 62 weeks, that's the 62 and the 7, that's 69 weeks, um, an anointed one shall be cut off and shall have nothing, and the troops of the prince who is to come and shall destroy the city and its sanctuary. Now, the historicist approach to this says that the 490 years are contiguous, they run one after the other, and that the 70th week was fulfilled from AD 27, which is when Jesus began his earthly ministry, to AD 34, when Stephen was killed before the Sanhedrin. And we can date that, we can date that through some of the more boring parts of prophecy. So if you turn in your Bible to Luke 3, and you say, how can we date the, 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 the baptism of Jesus? Well, that's not a hard thing to date, actually. You know, we don't know exactly where Jesus was born in Bethlehem. We don't know exactly where Calvary was. We don't know exactly where Golgotha was. We don't know, we don't know a lot of things about the life of Jesus, probably, so we don't turn them into idols. But in Luke chapter 3, it says there, verse 1, this is the kind of stuff that your eyes glaze over when you read, okay? It says, in the 15th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iteria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. So this is when the message comes to John the Baptist, that he's going to have a child, and, uh, no, when, when he's going to start his ministry, and that's where he baptizes Jesus. So how many characters are mentioned in those first three passages? You've got Tiberius, Pilate, Herod, Philip, Lysanias, Annas, and Caiaphas. That's seven characters. 
So how did they date things in the past? Uh, we dated it's 2021, yes? And what, what is 2021 based on? It's from the time of Jesus. Every significant event in your life is calculated from the time of Jesus. Your birthday, the date you retire, the date you get married, the date you bury somebody, the date you first draw your social security is all dated from the life of Jesus. So you, you say to the secular person, you don't believe in Jesus, do you? But every significant in your event in your life revolves around Jesus, whether you like it or not. Okay, but we date it from the time of Jesus. But before the time of Jesus, people would date time by the rulers. So you might say that if you have a child born in 2021, you might say, I was born in the first year of President Biden. That's how we date it. If we didn't have the, the, uh, the calendars that we used today, you say, I was born in the first year of, pres of President Biden. Or I was born in 1972, which is a long time ago. So we'd say, I was born in the 23rd year of Queen Elizabeth II. That's how I date my life, okay? Now, the Holy Spirit wants us to know exactly when Jesus started his ministry. And so he tells us it was the 15th year of Emperor um, Tiberius. And he gives us six other characters so that you can cross-reference. And there's no doubt whatsoever the year that Jesus was baptized. Because that's the fulfillment. That's when the 70th week starts of Daniel 9. So you've got, you've got a cross-reference, not just of one character, but you've got seven characters there. Okay, so that's why the, the Bible gives us all, all this extra information so that you, you can know with absolute certainty when Jesus started his ministry. Now, the, coming back to the, the futurist perspective, the futurist perspective, um, it comes from the Plymouth Brethren and you know, the Schofield Study Bible. Have you heard of that? The Schofield Study Bible, that talks about the, the gap theory. And what the, the Plymouth Brethren and then the futurists now say is, they say that there is a gap between the 69th and the 70th week. There's a gap. Now, it's not in the text, but they say there is a gap. And at the end of the 69th week, before the 70th week starts, there's going to be a rapture. Then there's going to be three and a half periods, years of tribulation. Okay, and the Antichrist is going to come and he's going to persecute people and everybody's going to have a second chance. And there's various permutations on this. It really is a devilish theory because what it says to you is you don't need to give your life to God until you see people disappearing in the rapture. And once they've raptured, then you know that this is for true, for real, and then you can give your life to God. Which is essentially saying to people, you don't need to give your life to God just yet. You know, just, just, just keep it in the pending file. And when you see the rapture take place, you've got three and a half years to make things right with God. Which really is, uh, in my opinion, a, a, almost a satanic doctrine, because it lulls people into a false sense of security. So praetorism puts most of Daniel and Revelation into the future away from the Catholic Church, away from the Middle Ages, away from the Protestant Reformation. And hey presto, the papacy is no longer the Antichrist that we find in Revelation and Daniel. And so futurism puts these prophecies in the future, praetorism puts them in the past. Now there's a growing way of interpreting these, these scriptures, and that is through saying there's a symbolic approach. And the symbolic approach, there are some Adventist interpreters who are pushing the symbolic approach to prophecy, and they're saying that um, actually, um, there is good and there is evil, and good wins, but beyond that we really can't say much. That's, that's, that's what it boils down to. So essentially, Daniel and Revelation become closed books to you, because if you say there's a battle between good and evil and good will win, well, you know, why do we have all this detail if that's all you need to know? So the symbolic approach is becoming more popular. So when it comes to Daniel 11, you see on the screen here, these are the events the sequence of events from a historicist understanding. This is Daniel 2. So ba the Babylon is the gold, the per Medo-Persians are the silver, the Greeks are the bronze, the Greek empire divided into four is not shown in Daniel 2. It is in Daniel 7, the four heads and four wings. Imperial Roman Empire is iron, and in Daniel 7 it's the fourth terrifying beast. The Imperial Roman Empire divided into ten, uh, the iron and the clay of the feet, and that's the ten horns on the fourth beast. You have papal Rome, is not shown explicitly in Daniel 2, but it's shown by the little horn that supplants three others in Daniel 7. The pre-advent judgment before Jesus comes again is not shown in Daniel 2, but that's shown in Daniel 7, 12, 13, and 14 by the heavenly court where the Ancient of Days takes his seats and the books were opened. Then you have the kingdom of God, that is the stone kingdom, and this is the saints of the Most High. They rule the universe with God, Daniel 7, 35 or so. Now it's interesting, the Muslims look at this prophecy as well, and they say that it's um, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greek, Imperial Rome, Papal Rome, and the stone is Islam. 
That's how they, inter they look at that prophecy as well. So when you talk with a Muslim, you've got to have a whole new perspective on this prophecy, that how do you say this is not Islam, as opposed to this being the kingdom? And to show that is the kingdom, you have to look at Jesus' teachings on the kingdom of God in the Gospels, where Jesus talks about it. But when it comes to Daniel 8 over here, now I don't want to break my leg again, so I'm going to bounce, bounce on the edge here, okay? All right, so we have Daniel 8. The Babylonian Empire is not represented in Daniel 8. Now why would that be? It's already on the way out, yeah. So, uh, Daniel 8, the vision is given when, when Daniel 8's on the way out. So, you have the ram representing the Medo-Persian Empire. You have the goat representing the Greek Empire. The goat, uh, you've got the four horns. That's the four heads and four wings. That's the Greek Empire divided into four. Then you have the little, four, little horn, phase one. Uh, that's the Imperial Roman Empire that spreads out horizontally in a, you know, geographical directions. And then you have the little horn, phase two, um, that's when it becomes a blasphemous persecuting power leading to the pre-advent judgment to the end of the 2300 days which is 1844 and it doesn't go down to the kingdom of God so Daniel 8 is kind of a partial vision and Daniel um, so, so you have that kind of parallelism there but then you come down to the Daniel 10, 11 and 12 I'm going to zoom in on this a bit now so there are three basic Adventist interpretations on Daniel 11. There's the Uriah Smith view, there's the atheism view, and there's the Islam view. That's the, that's the broad picture we want to share today. So, um, the, the Uriah Smith view um, holds that um, Turkey is the king of the north, and Egypt is the king of the south in 11 verses 40 through 45. Well, 11, 40 through 44. And um, why don't we just read those texts together so we're familiar with them. Uh, just so we can see what Uriah Smith is saying here. And Uriah Smith was a contemporary of Sister White. He was a very famous evangelist. And um, he wrote a book called Daniel and Revelation. If you've never read Daniel and Revelation, read it. If you've got a lockdown, read it in your lockdown. It's well worth reading. It's a fascinating book. It's important that you know your history. If you don't know your history, then you're a person without roots. And the person without roots is open to totalitarianism. So learn your history and spend time. It's worth doing. So Daniel chapter, where are we? Daniel chapter 11. Okay, Daniel chapter 11. And it says there, Daniel 11 verse 40, at, well some versions say in the time of the end, but uh, the, the preposition is ba, that means in or at, it can mean either in the Hebrew, which is very unhelpful for interpretive reasons. In the time of the end, the king of the north, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind with chariots and horsemen and with many ships. He shall advance against countries and pass through like a flood. He shall come into the beautiful land and tens of thousands shall fall victim. But Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites shall escape from his power. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries and land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the riches of Egypt. And the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall follow in his train. But reports from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to bring ruin and complete destruction to many. He shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the beautiful holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end with no one to help him. And at that time, Michael, your great prince, the protector of your people, shall arise. So this passage here, um, Uriah Smith traces, um, he traces the history of the Roman Empire. He goes down to the death of Jesus in 1122. And then he goes on um, for a bunch of verses, and what I'll do, I'll show on the screen here. Um, when I'm bored, I put this thing together. So I'm just going to make this real big. And let's see. So I put together a spreadsheet. Some of you may have seen this. There's the verse going down the left. Let me just make it a bit smaller. It's kind of like a labor of love. So I put together a spreadsheet with all the verses going down the left-hand side. And then across the top, you see I've got William Shea, Uriah Smith, John Wickham, Louis Weir, Mervyn Maxwell, Tim Rosenberg, Greg Bracture, etc., etc. All the various commentators are in Adventism who are commentating on this chapter. And um, sometimes they get upset with me how I summarize what they're saying. But anyway, that's very clear to you out there. And I can't read it from here, so... 
Uh, let's go back to Uriah Smith, shall we? Let's enlarge this so we can see Uriah Smith. Let's just hide this column here. And we'll hide these as well. So if you want like a quick cheat sheet for who says what, you can download this for free at the Daniel 11 website. So you see there, uh, Egypt, okay, we're going to come through to, so this is the verse on the left, verse 6. There's general agreement through to about verse 18 of what the, the, these kings of the north, kings of the south, represents the, the Ptolemies in Egypt fighting the Seleucids in, in Syria. They were two of the um, four kingdoms that emerged out of the Greek Empire. Let's come down to the death of Jesus here. And so, the, the one who imposes taxes on a glorious kingdom, there shall rise in his place one who imposes taxes on the glorious kingdom, but within a few days he shall be destroyed, but not in battle, generally considered to be Augustus Caesar, um, who, who really brought about the Roman Empire when he destroyed Pompey. And, uh, sorry, uh, Mark Antony, with, who fought with, um, what's her name, Cleopatra. But you got um, Caesar Augustus, who taxed the Roman Empire. That's the story of the Bethlehem story when Jesus is born. And then you've got, in his place shall arise a vile person to whom they will not give the honor, honor of royalty. He shall come in peaceably and seize the kingdom by intrigue. After Augustus Caesar, you have Tiberius Caesar, who was the adopted son of Augustus Caesar. Tiberius was a pedophile and the most vile of creatures. He retreated to an island off the coast of Italy and uh, basically would molest children there. And he's called a vile person in the book of Daniel. And when he died, nobody was upset when he died. And he was the emperor when Jesus died. And so um, it says, with the force of a flood, they shall be swept away from before him and also the prince of the covenant. Well, Tiberius Caesar, though he came in peaceably, um, he won major um, battles, particularly up in Germany and Northern Europe, and also the prince of the covenant. So in his reign, the prince of the covenant was broken. That's the crucifixion of Jesus in AD 31. So we tend to date Daniel 11:22 to the death of Jesus. And pretty most Adventist commentators see that. Uh, but once you get beyond that, Uriah Smith argued that, um, we won't go through all the verses in any great detail here, but he argued that, um, that you then take a, a jump back in time, 130 years, um, to have the civil war between Octavius and Mark Antony. And really, there's, there's nothing in the text. Normally, the prophecies go from A to Z. They don't go from A to F, then back to B again, then forward to Z. Uriah Smith takes a zigzag back in time, about 130 years, and there's nothing in the text to suggest that's what you would do, all right? Let's just be honest about it. That's become traditional Adventist interpretation, but there is nothing, there's nothing in the text of verse 23, 24, 25 to suggest that you're going to kind of zigzag back in time. Uh, but that's what he does. And so he goes back in time to Octavius and then to Constantinople. And uh, he says there in verse 20 time, 29, at the appointed time he shall return and go forward to the, go toward the south, but it shall not be like the latter, the former or the latter. And the appointed time, uh, the argument is that Constantine moved the capital from Rome to Constantinople in 330. And uh, so that from 30 BC would represent 360 years, a time that is a, a, a prophetic year, or 360 years. And there's a lot of Adventists dis dispute whether the appointed time, whether that should be interpreted as like a time, times or half time. I don't think the case is particularly strong for that, actually. But to come down, um, he then goes on, he's on stronger ground with most other Adventist interpreters. And it talks about... I'm going to make this a bit smaller because it keeps dropping on me. Um, here you've got the persecution of the saints. That's the papal supremacy. Most Adventists see these middle verses of Daniel 11, of 33, 34, 35, and 36 as the persecution of 12, 60 days persecution. Uh, whether, you're, whether you are Islam, atheism, or papacy, most people see that. And that corresponds to Daniel 7, the, 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 uh, the, the, the papacy, the little horn that's that prospers and persecutes the saints. Uh, but then you come to 36, and Uriah Smith takes a detour here, and he argues that the, the king who will speak according to his own will, he shall exalt and magnify himself. Um, most Adventists have seen that historically as being the, the papacy in its final blasphemous stage before the 1798 um, overthrow by, by revolutionary France. 
Uriah Smith applies that to revolutionary France. And so for 36, 37, 38, and 39, Uriah Smith argues that those four verses relate to um, atheism and as manifest in, in revolutionary France. And then you come to the time of the end. And in the time of the end, what happened in 1798? Well, not only did the, the, the papacy overthrown by the, the, um, the French uh, Revolution, but there was a war in, in, it, in Egypt. And Napoleon Bonaparte um, invaded Egypt. And um, being French, he wasn't going to win any war, was he? So that's an Englishman speaking. But. <laughs> anyway, he wasn't going to win any war. He could start a war, but he wasn't going to win any war. So uh, Uriah Smith argues there's, there's not two actors in this verse, and that the Hebrew is really obscure. The prepositions, there's lots of he's and him's here, and it's very hard to figure out how many he's and how many him's are there. This, this isn't preferred pronouns, this is, um, this is historical actors. And so, historically, Napoleon Bonaparte invaded Egypt and he won the Battle of the Nile, and then he decided to advance up the coast of the Holy Land or Israel, up past Joppa, and he was moving up past Jerusalem up to modern-day Haifa, and the Ottoman Empire got really upset with this, and they sent a massive army down from Turkey, and they drove the, the, the French all the way back down to Egypt. And while they were in Egypt, the English fleet under Lord Nelson um, wiped out the French fleet at, at the Battle of the Nile. And so he lost his ships and the conquest of, of Egypt was over. And so because, because he says, he argues for that, Uriah Smith, you see, on, you see there, here's verse 41. It says, he shall enter the glorious land. And in the book of Daniel, the phrase the glorious land is often, or the beautiful land, generally refers to Israel. Israel. And so Uriah Smith is consistent in his interpretation of the glorious land is literally it is Israel. So Israel is somehow invaded by the, the Ottomans, which they did in 1798. And um, he shall stretch out his hand against countries. The land of Egypt shall not escape. Sultan Selim III of Turkey did reconquer Egypt, making a province of the Ottoman Empire. And he, 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 the, um, the Egyptians and the nations around paid tribute, which is in verse 43. That is what happened historically. And then he argues that news from the east and north shall trouble him. Now, Adventists since the 1940s have interpreted that as being the, the tidings of the coming of Jesus for a whole variety of reasons. And those are good reasons. But Uriah Smith argued that troubles news from the east and the north was the news that uh, Russia and Persia from the north and east of the Ottomans were invading, and that was the Crimean War, uh, where the Pers Persians and the Russians and the English tried to destroy the Ottoman Empire. They were known as the sick man of Europe. Which leads us down to verse 45. And he shall plant the tent of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and no one will help him. Now this is an interesting verse because let me just make this smaller so that the screen doesn't keep dropping off from me here. I'm not sure why it's, 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 it's playing dodgeball with me or something. All right, can you see that? All right. You can't see that. I can barely see it. So, assuming with Uriah Smith that the beautiful land or the glorious land is Palestine or Israel, the text says he, that is the king of the north, shall plant the tents of his palace and that, that phrase tent is tabernacle. So when it says tabernacle of his palace, tabernacle has a spiritual connotation, palace has a civic ruler connotation. That implies that this is a union of church and state at the end of time. That's what it implies. The tabernacle of his palace will be planted in the glorious land between the seas and the glorious holy mountain. Well, there are two seas. You know, there's Israel, there's the Mediterranean, and there's the Dead Sea. And so uh, on the glorious holy mountain would logically be, say, the Mount of Olives or Mount Zion. And so the Uriah Smith um, scholar, neo-Uriah Smith scholars, argue that um, we are going to see um, Turkey, or a reinvigoration of the Ottoman Empire, attacking Israel and establishing a caliphate in, in, in Jerusalem, uh, wiping out the state of Israel, but he shall come to his end and there shall be no one to help him. It will usher in a global conflict. Now, was, is that likely? I mean, Uriah Smith makes a good case, and to be fair to Uriah Smith, he's consistent in his interpretive principles all the way through his book. There's no question about that. 
His major problem is that after the death of Jesus, he zigzags back 130 years for no reason in history. So as he's moving from um, Daniel all the way to Christ, then he zigs back 130 years, has a little interlude, then he picks up history again. So why does he do that? And we, nobody knows why he did that. And so it's kind of a weakness in his argument. Now, the, the question is, would you see historically, did, did it 11 through 44 play out literally historically as he said it would? Yes, it did. There's no question about that. Um, so if you were to uh, interpret Daniel 11 as per Uriah Smith, you'd be now looking for a reinvigorated caliphate to take out Israel. Now, ISIS inspired a lot of interest. They were the reinvigoration of the caliphate. Muslims believe that um, the, 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 the rightly guided ruler, the leader of the Muslim world is the caliph. He is God's representative on earth. Their role is to establish the caliphate. That's the rule of Islam around the whole world. And ISIS, their main supporter was Turkey. When I was in Istanbul, I'd meet, I'd meet ISIS fighters in the hotels coming and going. You'd see the w wounded ISIS fighters coming back from the front. You'd see fresh guys arriving from Europe and from Latin America and from Africa flying into Istanbul on the same flights that you fly in. And you know they're going down to fight for ISIS just across the border. And Turkey was the major supporter for ISIS. And the Turkish president, he's built a palace in Ankara that is basically the... Um, a, a model of the, the, uh, the caliph at the sultan's palace in Istanbul. And he talks, he's modeling himself as the, as the reincarnation of the caliph. And Muslims yearn for the caliphate to come back. Why? Because when the Muslim world was united in one caliphate, where, whether it was the, um, the, the various, um, you know, the Abbasids, the Abayasids, and so forth, the various rulers of the Muslim world, the West trembled before the military might of Islam for over a thousand years. And they want that back. And so it's a very emotive appeal to Muslims to join the caliphate. And ISIS were re-establishing the caliphate. So um, Turkey to this day is still, want, they make noises. They want to be the caliphate. The Turkish president wants to be the returned ruler. And it hasn't happened yet. And I would say that, you know, if Turkey manages to conquer Jerusalem and wipe out Israel, you're probably seeing a fulfillment of that prophecy. I mean, it, the prophecy would, it would work out historically. That's if that happens. So... Um, that's kind of the, 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 that particular view. The, the, the second view in Christi, in Adventism, is the atheism view. Now, the atheism view, that's a summary of the atheism view there. And the atheism view argues that everything is understood historically and literally up to the time of Jesus, but after the time of Jesus, prophecies are to be interpreted in a more spiritual way. Uh, so you have ancient Babylon in Jeremiah and Daniel, but by the time you get to Revelation, are we talking about literal Babylon or spiritual Babylon? Okay, when you talk about Israel in Old Testament prophecy, are you talking about ethnic Israel or spiritual Israel? In the Old Testament. Ethnic. By the time you get to the New Testament, we have spiritual Israel. And so they, they argue that everything after Calvary is to be interpreted spiritually. The major <laughs> scholars there are Hans Larondel. Maybe you've heard of him, Hans Larondel. And you've also heard of Louis Weir. Now, Louis Weir was an Australian... And as, um, anybody here from Australia? <coughs> no, all right. Well, I won't quote Nicodemus then. Uh, no, not, not Nicodemus. Um, who was the one that Jesus saw? Nathaniel. Nathaniel, yes. What did Nathaniel <coughs> say about Australia? Uh, so, um, the papacy in the atheism position. So, Louis Weir argued in the mid 1940s that it was absurd to expect um, Turkey, which had been destroyed by World War II, to become the Ottoman Empire again and to take out Jerusalem. Therefore, we need a new approach, a new approach to the text. Now, Uriah Smith's argument was based on the flow of history up to where he saw it. And Louis Weir's argument is not so much based on the flow of history, but it's saying, what are the linguistic parallels between Daniel 11 and other passages in scripture? So, Uriah Smith is looking at the history and the problem with that is you can always make history fit today's, prophecy fit today's history, all right? And uh, Louis Weir said, let's not look at the history per se, but let's look at the, um, what, what are the parallels between this mm, king of the north and king of the south and what we find elsewhere in the Bible. And in particular, he looks at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, the passage about the man of sin. And there are very significant linguistic parallels between the king of the north as a blasphemous power in Daniel 11 and the man of sin in, Daniel, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so Louis Weir, he doesn't look at the history so much. He looks at what are the parallels with the other passages of scripture. 
And according to the atheism view, the King of the North is the papacy. Verses 36 through 39 represents the flowering of the papacy in its, in it, just before it was uh, cut down by the French Revolution. And uh, then um, from 1140 onwards, you have a struggle between the papacy and atheism. The King of the South representing atheism. And why do they say that represents atheism? Well, the essential argument for that is based on Exodus chapter 5. And if you want to turn there, you'll see why they say atheism is, the King of the South is based on atheism, the end time King of the South. And this is Moses and Aaron going to Pharaoh, they're saying, let my people go, etc. But in verse 2, it says, but Pharaoh said, now Pharaoh was the king of which nation? Egypt is north or south of Israel. So therefore they say that this is the king of the south because it's, everything is in, understood in relation to Israel. But Pharaoh said, who is the Lord? And in capitals, it's in capitals in your Bible, yes? So who is the Lord? That means, that means who is Yahweh? That I should listen to him and let Israel go. I do not know Yahweh and I will not let Israel go. And so for that reason, Egypt represents a rejection of Yahweh. Okay, so it's not strictly atheism. It's a rejection of Yahweh. There's a subtle but important difference. We assume that Egypt was atheist. No, they had many gods that they worshipped. They were just rejected Yahweh. The king of the north represents, we st we're still saying this interpretation, but the papacy, and pretty much everybody agrees on that, at least other than Uriah Smith, but the king of the south is understood to represent a rejection of Yahweh. And so you might say that the spirit of the king of the south is rejection of Jesus, and the spirit of the king of the north is a spirit of domination, if you look at like the controlling spirit behind these powers, beyond the, the historical actors. So the king of the south represents atheism in the atheism view, and the king of the north represents the papacy. And uh, this view, the, the major writer here is Louis Weir, and you can get his books from Layman's Ministries International. They, keep, they, have all, they own all the copyrights on that, and you can go and buy them. They're a few dollars each. Um, he's dead a long time ago. And um, so um, we, we correlate Daniel 11 with Revelation 12 through 14, the, the you know, end time vision of Daniel there, of, Revel of John, and 2 Thessalonians, particularly chapter 2. And uh, there's a lot of pa linguistic parallels. I'm not going to go into them here today, but there's a lot of parallels there. If you're going to interpret scripture from scripture, the atheism view has by far the strongest support within the scriptures. There's a lot of linguistic parallels there. And so the atheism view was the dominant view in Adventism from about 1945 till about the year 2000. And then you come to the Islam view, and our time is really moving on here. The, the, the Islam view um, seeks to reinterpret Daniel chapter 11 from the time of Jesus as having three conflicts between Islam and Christianity. And the first of those conflicts was the Crusades. The second of those conflicts was the, those, you know, from like um, nine, uh, 1090 to about 1300. The second of those conflicts was the conflict with the Ottomans, with the ships of Kittim there being uh, the Battle of Lepanto um, in what, 15 something, rather 1520 or so. And now in the time of the end, there is a third conflict between the King of the South, because the South is south of the Mediterranean, that's Islam, and the King of the North, that was historically the papacy covering the northern half of the Mediterranean. And so the Islam view pushes the idea that there are three conflicts between Christianity and Islam. Now that parallels the trumpets of Revelation. Uh, the historic view of the trumpets revelation is that the fifth trumpet, there are three woes in Revelation, that's trumpets five, six, and seven. You familiar with that? Yes, am I, am I losing you here? You're still with me? There are, there are seven trumpets in Revelation. This is going very fast. There are seven trumpets in Revelation. And the last three trumpets, now which way I go? Five, okay. The last three trumpets, okay, I'm not, I'm not swearing at anybody. I'll do it this way just to make sure. Okay, so, no, those are, that's eight, isn't it? That's yeah. eight. All right, so the last, you have seven trumpets, and four of them have gone, the first four trumpets, and then you've got trumpets five, six, and seven. And the fifth trumpet is the fifth, is in Revelation 9 is the first woe, and the sixth trumpet is the second woe, and the seventh trumpet is the third woe. Now, if you turn to your Bible, how do we date this thing? Well, we know when the seventh trumpet starts. We know that through a simple little phrase in the book of Revelation, that the seventh trumpet starts, the third, sorry, the seventh trumpet and the third woe starts in Revelation chapter 11. Look at Revelation chapter 11. 
verse 14. It says, the second woe has passed, the third woe is coming soon. And the next verse says, then the seventh angel blew his trumpet, and there were loud voices in heaven. So the seventh angel, the seventh trumpet, is the third woe. I hope you're keeping up with this. And um, when does it start? There's a bit of stuff about praise in heaven, but verse 18 says, the nations raged, but your wrath has come, and the time for judging the dead. What is the time for judging the dead? When does that begin? 1844. So we can date the beginning of the seventh trumpet, the third woe onwards, to 1844, which is well within the time of the end, because that starts at least in 1798, at the end of the 1260-year prophecy. So the seventh trumpet corresponds to the time from 1844 to the coming of Jesus. Now the fifth trumpet you find in Revelation chapter 9. We look at Revelation chapter 8, verse 13. Revelation 8, 13. This is the, four, the fifth, sixth, and seventh trumpets, and you've got the three woes. Revelation 8, 13 says, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth at the blasts of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. And the fifth angel blew his trumpet. So that's the fifth angel, and you come down to verse 11. It's 12, and it says, The first woe has passed. So the fifth angel is the first woe. Then it says in verse 12, There are still two woes to come. Then the sixth angel blew his trumpet. And then to Revelation 11:14, the second woe has passed. So it's very clear that the first, first woe is the fifth trumpet, the second woe is the sixth trumpet, and the third woe is the seventh trumpet. And, um, and generally speaking, it is in t the fifth woe is interpreted for a whole variety of reasons, and we could talk till the cows come home about this. The fifth trumpet is recognized as being this, the, the, um, the Saracen Jihad that erupted um, during, during the, the times of the Crusades and so forth. And it runs, um, it runs through to the time of the start, about 1299 or so, the time of the start of the Ottomans. And then the, the sixth trumpet, the second woe, is the, the Ottoman um, assault on Turkey, the fall of Constantinople. And uh, then the seventh, then, then you've got the 391 year prophecy, which ends in 1840, August 1840, there in chapter nine. And so you've got the Saracen Jihad, then you've got the Ottoman Jihad, and so therefore they say, if the fifth trumpet is the first woe, and that's Jihad, and the sixth trumpet is the second woe, and that's Jihad, logically the, third trump the th seventh trumpet and third woe must also be Jihad. It's kind of like an extension. There's nothing in the seventh trumpet to suggest that at all, really, there's nothing there, but that's the argument that they make. And so they say that in the, in the Islamic interpretation of Daniel 11, you first of all got from 23 to about 34, you've got the, 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 the Crusades, and then you've got the Ottoman struggle with the Ottomans in the middle of the Mediterranean through the Middle Ages, and then finally from Daniel 11:40 onwards, you've got at the time of the end, but they changed the interpretation from at the time of the end, because at the time of the end implies it starts in 1798, doesn't it? But they change it to in the time of the end, which means that it's during the time of the end, which means it doesn't have to start in 1798, which means that the King of the South attacking the King of the North could happen any time from 1798 onwards to the time of Jesus. Are you following me on this? Yeah, so there's some kind of linguistic games going on here. And the, the, you, you can honestly translate it in the time of the end or at the time of the end. The, the Hebrew preposition ba, just like a b, it just means in or at. And you can translate it both ways. So they're not being dishonest with this. So the, the Islam view, um, the Islam view is the um, the Islam view is the most vocal view these days. Um, they post a lot of things. They write a lot of papers. Um, what I see between these three positions is that, that the Uriah Smith view um, doesn't have many adherents these days, um, but it's the most internally consistent view in its and how it interprets Daniel 11. It doesn't shift from historical to spiritual. It doesn't shift the identities of the King of the North and King of the South. So it has an internal consistency to it. The major problem is, why does Uriah Smith zigzag back in time? Then he picks up again with the persecution of the saints in the Middle Ages. The atheism view is still the dominant view in Adventism today. And we see in our world today, you, if you looked at the news, you could agree with the papacy view, the atheism view, and you could also agree with the Islam view. Uh, you could say that in our world today, in America today, we are facing a rise of um, a rejection of God in our nation right now. We are facing a rise, whether it's 
critical theory, whether it's critical race theory, whether it's cultural Marxism, whatever it is, LGBTQ revolution, we are facing a rise of a rejection of the authority of Yahweh in our nation and across the West. That's very clear. That is a force across the West. Um, and the papacy may not appear to be as strong as it was historically, but you never write the papacy off. And, but you also see around the world today, there are many movements to reinvigorate Islam. And um, of those three positions, I think that probably the atheism view is still the strongest. And the reason why I think that is that when you compare um, Revelation, Daniel 11 to Revelation 17, which is the woman who rides the seven-headed beast, there are five heads that were, and there, was, there are the seven heads, and each head has a crown, except for the, the, the six, fifth head, yes? Sixth head. The sixth head of that seven-headed beast does not have a crown, and uh, that is normally understood by Adventists to represent from 1798 when the papacy lost her status until the fatal, fatal wound is healed. So if the, seven, if the sixth head corresponds to the, corresponds to the, um, the, the deadly wound, the papacy not having political authority, that means what caused the deadly wounds, and that was 1798. And so that would line up more with the atheism view than with the Islam view. So when you, when you correlate Revelation 17 with Daniel 11, I think it's much clearer in my mind that the atheism view is stronger. But the, the truth of the matter is, when, when you look at this spreadsheet, and I'd encourage you to read it and to enjoy it, encourage you to read through it and enjoy it. And, you know, here we are talking about uh, the ultramontanism. I had to look at what is ultramontanism. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of scholars and interpreters here, and, and some of them get a bit fanciful, but the, the three basic extremes are, are well known, that the basic contours of their arguments are well established. And, you know, the, the position of an Adventist church administrator is, we shall know when we see it. That's the frustrating position of Adventist administrators, yes? Because they know that churches split over the interpretation of Daniel 11. But four years ago when we started this process, there were at least like five positions on Daniel 11, and now it's kind of coming down to like two and a half. So the process of, and you know, some of you comments about the papers, they're kind of academic and so forth, but the process of discussion, discussion, discussion over the text, praying over it, just chipping away at things, and how certain are you that? It's like you're assuming this is this. Why do you assume that is what you say it is? Over the last three to four years, we've kind of knocked two of those positions out of the ballpark and really, it's down to um, the atheism view is still standing strong, and the papal view, three years ago, was strong. It's getting weaker by the day. And the, the Islam view, and the reason for that is that the Islam view really arose when ISIS erupted onto the scene. And as ISIS has been bombed out of existence, it's hard to keep up with the Islam view. But the problem is egos get involved and, um, and all the rest of it, so people don't want to give up their cherished positions. So um, it's, the, the process is, t is, is long, it's arduous, there's a lot of discussion, a lot of prayer, a lot of debate, but um, I think that what we see in our world today with um, to, uh, to a spirit of totalitarianism arising across the West, um, we are seeing today, um, we've always assumed as Adventists that the apostate Protestants are the right-wing Protestants, haven't we? The moral majority, the religious right, but that's based on what Sister White says about apostate Protestantism reaching out and joining hands with Rome. And we have always assumed that she's talking about right-wing Protestantism. Now, why have we assumed that? Because in the 1880s, it was the Republicans who were pushing the Sunday laws with Senator Blair. And because of that, the Adventists all switched into California to voting Democrat in the 1880s, 1890s. Now, th those aren't the Republicans and Democrats of today, clearly. So we have always assumed that the Republicans and the moral rights are going to bring in, they're going to join hands with Rome. But what we see today is we have a woke pope, for want of a better phrase. He's bought into a lot of the critical theory stuff. We are seeing a secular environmentalist movement that's talking about the Green Sabbath movement. If you've never heard of the Green Sabbath movement, it's very popular in Europe. And um, the, uh, Greta Thunberg, you know, with her school strikes, Kids around the world have encouraged the school strike for one day to give the world a break from the cycle of consumption. 
the Green Sabbath movement in Europe is getting very powerful, and they're arguing that everybody should have one day of rest a year, to, a, a week, to break the cycle of consumption of the Earth's resources. And so the, the secular environmentalists are pushing for a day of rest. The papacy, with its Laudato Si encyclical, is pushing for a day of rest. That was issued before the Paris Climate Change Treaty in 2014-15. The Biden administration is pushing for global coordinated action on the emergency of climate check, the, the global climate crisis. And the Protestant denominations of America, by and large, have adopted critical theory and critical race theory as their hermeneutics. They are now s swinging very hard to the far left. So they're, they're approving gay marriage, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a good example is the United Methodist Church. If you're following what's happening in the United Methodists, it's almost an exact parallel to the Adventist Church. In 2018, the Methodists had a general conference in Indianapolis of their world church. And their North American division of Methodists, they wanted to approve gay um, marriage and gay ordination. And the Southern Hemisphere of the United Methodist Church said, no, we're not voting for this. Like in our general conference in 2015, mostly Southern Hemisphere Adventists said no to women's ordination. After the 2017 general conference with the United Methodists, their North American Methodists said, well, we're not going to listen to the decision of the World Church. We're going to push ahead with this anyway. Like our NAD pushed ahead with women's ordination, ignoring the decision of the World Church. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying these are the facts. And what happened was the United Methodists have split down the middle. They've put together this euphemistically known something like the, the sacrament of grace and reconciliation, which is basically how do we split and never see each other again. And uh, what's effectively happening is that um, individual United Methodist congregations are allowed to join the Global Methodist Church, which is a new denomination in America that was allied to the major worldwide Methodist Church, and they do not have gay ordination, um, but they can't leave their churches because the churches are owned by their conferences, and if they join the Global Methodist Church, they lose their churches. And so there's, there's legal fights about money and property and all that kind of stuff. So as we speak, the United Methodist Church is in brutal meltdown. It may not exist in another 18 months. It's just gone. And that's almost a prophecy of what may happen to our NAD, if we're not careful. Um, but that's a, a good instance. We see the rise of left-wing ideology across our nation. Our Protestant churches have gone woke. The papacy is woke. The environmentalists are woke. And the Biden administration is woke. All the key players are lined up, and they all want a day of rest, either for spiritual reasons or for environmental reasons. So don't be saying it can't happen without a Republican in office. That's a false assumption based on the phrase apostate Protestantism. We now have apostate Protestantism in North America because our big denominations, Evangelical Lutherans, Presbyterian Church of the USA, United Methodists, Episcopalians, all have approved homosexual ordination. So you know, or homosexual marriage. So they've all gone that way. So um, I think I've talked a lot, brother. I was supposed to give you just a, a brief introduction and questions and answers. I'm supposed to be in the youth tent at four o'clock. What's the time now? Four o'clock. Oh, isn't that convenient? <laughs> all right. Your biological clock is yeah, when I, had, when I did my doctorate, you have to have a viva where you get invited for questions and you have four doctors, uh, professors of theology, asking you questions, and they each have 15 minutes to ask you questions, and then there's a break, then they all ask you another question for 15 minutes, each one of them, you have three rounds of this, just to check your general knowledge, and I said to my wife, I am not giving up the microphone, <laughs> so when the first guy asks the first question, I'll talk out the 15 minutes, I'm not going to give him a chance to ask the next question, and so when the next guy asks his question, I'll talk it out for 15 minutes. And that's what I did for my entire time, and it worked. So, um, so that's what I did to get through the, the Viva. But uh, one question was, um, can you discuss uh, the, the impact of the Puritan divines on, on contemplative prayer? And I'd never read anything about the Puritan divines about contemplative prayer, but I spoke intelligently for 15 minutes on the topic, which is drawing on general knowledge and um, yeah, so, so we, we've, we've taken up the full hour here, and I am due in the youth tent now, but um, if you go to daniel11prophecy.com, take a look at that spreadsheet. It's for free. It's in the general resources section. I update it every couple of months, and that will give you an overview of what the key interpreters are saying, and it's not saying why they say this, but it's saying this is, what, this is their conclusion on the matter, but it is clear to me Whatever you say about Daniel 11, that we're living in the time of the end, 
number one. And number two, freedom of conscience is now under threat, exactly as you read in Revelation 13. So the question for us as Adventists is, we want to sequence out the end time events. We want to know when is Jacob's time of trouble, when is the little time of trouble, when is the close of probation, when is etc., etc., etc. That's not the right question to be asking. The right question to be asking is, I know it's happening, am I ready for it? And is my family ready for it, and is my church ready for it? That's the right question to be asking. Because... The question, these questions are Eurocentric and American centric ideas. If you're a Christian in Afghanistan or Turkey or Israel or Nigeria, you're already facing that persecution. It's only we who've been blessed not to have persecution that you have the luxury to ask these questions. Okay? So we're the minority in the Christian world. Many Christians are already experiencing persecution. So um, we may debate that the, the scheduling and the, and the sequencing of these events. And to a Christian who's been in China for like 20 years in a labor camp, it, these questions are kind of like immaterial. Okay? And that's not far from America, the way things are going. So the more important question is not, um, is not um, wh- who is the king of the north, who is the king of the south, but Jesus is the central figure in this prophecy in Daniel 10, 12, and 11. Am I right with him? Do I know him? Is he going to stand up for me? When he stands up, will I be found among the righteous? Those are the more important kinds of questions to be asking right now. So, our time is up, and I've talked out my hour. Thank you very much. And um, my wife says, don't ask me a question. And so, I'll talk, talk out till you get bored with the answer. So, thank you very much, everybody. And if you have any questions, what's your name, brother, again? You can connect with Brother Ashley, who has questions on 9-11. So obviously he studied it a bit. So you can connect with him if you have questions. So thank you very much, everybody. And may God bless you as you study and as we look to live through this time of the end. Thank you. Amen.